podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances. Amazing Grace is the surprising true story of John Newton, author of the song that has touched millions. A biography that reads like a novel, it reveals Newton's dramatic story of sin and salvation as a slave trader before his ultimate transformation to speaking out against the horror of slavery. His story speaks to the brokenness within us all and our need for God's amazing grace and reveals the truth behind his song. Amazing Grace is based on years of research on the life and writings of John Newton. It tells of a prodigal who returns home and a young love that defies the odds, of a young man whose life is torn by grief and wounded by the cruelty of others, following his descent into deeper suffering and finally into the brutal world of the slave trade. Newton rejects God repeatedly, but is rescued by a divine mercy that reaches deeper than he could ever have imagined as he ultimately faces his past and repents. Newton's story is shocking, and Amazing Grace does not try to airbrush or excuse his faults. There are glaring contradictions in the life of a ship's captain who retreats to his cabin to study his Bible and write tender love letters to his wife while hundreds of slaves lie in chains in the hold below. The profound lessons from his life are applicable to us today. Since the first public singing of Amazing Grace almost 250 years ago, every generation has been profoundly moved by the song. And now readers can connect with John Newton's story like never before. In these days of extreme polarization, when beliefs about race, church, and politics have all become deeply divisive in society, we need grace more than ever. We need stories like this one that talk honestly about the human condition, but even more about the relentless love of God and his forgiveness of sins. Now, here's an exclusive sample of Amazing Grace, the life of John Newton and the surprising story behind his song. Preface Swiss Air Flight 111 was en route from New York to Geneva on the evening of September 2, 1998, when it suddenly plummeted 2,400 metres into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Nova Scotia, killing all 229 people on board. The tiny tourist village of Peggy's Cove was immediately transformed into a command centre for the police, coast guard and other emergency officials. Shocked family members arrived to look out over the waves that held their loved ones. An army chaplain went to the water's edge and offered to pray with the grieving family of a 19-year-old California student. He led them in prayer, and then the family started to sing a hymn in four-part harmony, and then followed this with amazing grace. The chaplain noticed that all the rescue workers and onlookers were transfixed by the scene. Everyone stopped until they were done. He added, things like that were going on all day. Amazing grace in the middle of incredible sorrow. It was on those same North Atlantic seas 250 years earlier that John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, first cried out to God for mercy in the midst of a storm that threatened to kill all on board a foundering ship bound for England. Newton wrote Amazing Grace some years afterward, when he was settled to parish church in the English Midlands as an Anglican minister. But the hymn has endured through two and a half centuries and has become today a powerful symbol for many people of hope in the midst of tragedy. The hymn has figured prominently at moments of intense national grieving in America. After the space shuttle Challenger burst into flames on television in 1986, the American people heard Amazing Grace played at the memorial service for the astronauts. After a domestic terrorist exploded a bomb at an Oklahoma City federal building in 1995, killing 168 people, Amazing Grace was again carried from church services by television news programs. <laughs> 
The Memorial Mass for John F. Kennedy Jr. in July 1999 concluded with the singing of Amazing Grace as well. In 2001, immediately after the terrorist attacks on September the 11th, a spontaneous candlelight vigil began in Union Square and people started again to sing Amazing Grace. This did not just happen in New York. Amazing Grace was sung at both formal and ad hoc memorials across the United States. This song continues to be sung at commemorations of the event and in other times of public tragedy and private grief. Examples abound. Amazing Grace is, as one critic observed, the spiritual national anthem of America. In Canada, on November 20th, 1998, at the memorial service for Michel Trudeau, the son of former Prime Minister of Canada Pierre Trudeau, who was killed in a skiing accident, Amazing Grace was played on bagpipes. Two years later, on the anniversary of the Columbine High School shootings in America, a student at a high school in Orleans near Ottawa stabbed four fellow students and a school instructor before giving himself up to the authorities. In the pandemonium and shock afterward, a number of Pentecostal students gathered at the front of the school, held hands and began to pray. They were soon joined by other students, Christian and non-Christian alike. Spontaneously, they began to sing Amazing Grace. That was when the media noticed the prayer circle and the cameras focused on the 40 to 45 students. It was on the national news that evening. Perhaps even more remarkably, this song that was written by a former slave trader has been taken up by African-American congregations and made their own. This was true before and after emancipation in America. Amazing Grace became a song of personal testimony. It was gospel music greats like Mahalia Jackson who offered the song to a wider audience yet. She recorded Amazing Grace for Apollo Records on December the 10th, 1947. Her soulful version of the hymn was played on the radio in the immediate post-war years and helped to move Amazing Grace into the popular consciousness once and for all. It was there to be sung during the Civil Rights Movement. It was there to be sung during the Vietnam years. It was there for everyone who needed a prayer for grace in times of pain and unrelenting wretchedness. After a white supremacist shot and killed nine African Americans in Charleston, South Carolina, at an evening Bible study on June 17, 2015, including the politician and senior pastor of the Mother Emmanuel AME Church, Reverend Clementa Pinckney, President Barack Obama gave the eulogy for the slain pastor. In the middle of the president's remarks, he paused. He wasn't sure whether he would do this, but when the moment came, it seemed right to him. President Obama began singing Amazing Grace. He knew the congregation would join in with him right away, and they did. It was a powerful moment. Where do we find hope today in the midst of deep divisions in society and violent disagreements? Where do we find hope for the human condition? Where do we find hope for all the griefs and sorrows that threaten to undo our lives? Perhaps we need to look again at the perennial message of amazing grace. Perhaps here we might find a renewed hope that however difficult the troubles in our lives, however deep our personal shame and regret, however dark the evil that stalks the earth, there is a mercy that is deeper yet, a forgiveness that makes all the difference, and a power for reconciliation greater than ourselves. The 250th anniversary of the writing of the hymn by John Newton is a fitting occasion to discover the remarkable story behind the song and to learn something of the dramatic life of its author. In this story is a message of grace for us all today, one we need to hear now more than ever. When John Newton wrote his autobiography in 1764 at nearly 40 years of age, he published it anonymously with an almost tabloid-style title, an authentic narrative of some remarkable and interesting particulars in the life of 
nine asterisks. The cover promised a faithful retelling of what would be some extraordinary experiences. It did not disappoint. The book you hold presents Newton's story retold for another generation. Like his autobiography, it also seeks to be an authentic narrative, taking the real drama of his life and filling out the scenes based on the hints he gave us and from what we can reconstruct from other historical sources. For example, in the first chapter, we combine the facts of 18th century Wapping, where Newton grew up, with his own recollections to recreate his early boyhood as vividly as it would have been for him, including a dead body. We want you to have a front row seat to his biography as it unfolds in real time. Importantly, though, we have used our imagination not only to add colour or to embellish an old story, but also to enter as fully as possible into John Newton's mind and his world at every stage. We have based these imagined scenes on the many sources he left us, including his autobiography, diaries, logbooks, letters and extensive published writings. To this has been added research into other contemporary sources and the considerable scholarship available on Newton and his times. His world was as real as ours, just as tactile, visual and audible, and we want you to feel this. This has meant creating fictional but plausible dialogue and conceivable episodes to fill in the biographical facts and framework as realistically as possible, and represents the inner life of Newton and his contemporaries. Sometimes the dialogue is verbatim, drawn from Newton's letters and other writings, and at other times it is imagined. But this is not a novel. It is a dramatised biography with the feel of a film or live play. It is important for readers to know that the principal narrative, the chronology, and all the proper names, people, places, ships, and documents hymns, letters, books, minutes of meetings, etc., follow the sources exactly. In fact, in several places we have quietly corrected details that were mistaken in earlier biographies. We have included some notes on sources for each chapter at the end of the book and a short bibliography for those who would like to dig deeper into the historical record. In drawing upon original sources and manuscripts, we have modernised spelling punctuation and capitalization, where this would otherwise be a distraction for the reader. In the end, we hope the result for you, as a reader, will be a lively story that captures the deep truth of John Newton's life, one that places you right in the midst of the drama. If you feel what he felt, see him striding proudly along the River Thames in his sea coat, feel the slap of the salty sea spray on his cheeks in the North Atlantic, and hear the clop of horse hooves on the cobbles of the 18th century city streets he walked, then you have actually gotten a little closer to Newton. Our hope is that this will be another authentic narrative of some still very remarkable and interesting particulars in the life of John Newton. When you read about Newton's dramatic life, immersing yourself in it like this, you will inevitably pause now and again to compare his experience to yours. He made some very foolish decisions. Well, so have we. He did things that were shameful. We hate to admit it, but so have we. He fell punch drunk in love as a young man and often acted stupidly. And, oh, we can remember those moments in our own lives. And so on. And then, as Newton descends into deeper darkness, ready even to kill himself and capable of murder, we are left to ponder the times we too have been desperate and felt that all hope was lost. Even harder, when he sinks so low as to enter into the slave trade, unaware at the time of how evil this was, we may have to pause and ask ourselves whether we could be capable of something like that. Most of all, though, as Newton finds mercy and forgiveness, and when he shows remorse and grows in wisdom and love, we may be inspired to think, if there was grace for him, maybe there can be grace for me too.
A story like Newton's invites us to be honest about failure, about wretchedness, about the things to which we were once blind. If amazing grace means anything, it means this. In Newton's story, we see a clear illustration of the fact that nobody comes to Christ painlessly or all at once. That though the gift of grace is freely given, none of us receive the gospel without having to go deeper, well beyond the moment of initial conversion. The more we become aware of how deep is our need for grace, the more we understand how precious a gift it is. And so Newton's story is a journey of discovery, a journey we must all travel ourselves. In Newton's life, we see a parable of how we need grace far more than we initially thought. We see that we have been complicit in things that have been deeply hurtful to others. We see that the older we get, the more we need grace, for the closer we get to the light, the more impurities show up. Maturity means knowing more and more how much we stand in need of God's grace and walking therefore with humility and gentleness, just as Newton did. But at every step, God is at work, calling us home to himself. There is room enough yet in this story for us all. Chapter 1 Death 1725-1732 John Newton woke up blind in the darkness and lay there, perfectly still. His eyes were half-welded shut, crusted tight by sleep. The house was locked up in silence too. Nobody was stirring. Not the old couple who slept in the room next door. Not the maid in the scullery below. Yet there was something calling to him, something propelling him out from under the stiff cotton blanket that his father had brought back from one of his many voyages. Alexandria, Venice, John could never remember. Not that it mattered. He kicked the blanket off and crept out into the darkness. After all, it wasn't every day a boy got to see a dead body. The room was unfamiliar to him, but he did not light a candle. His exit had been well planned, and he had laid all his clothes out in order the night before. His yellow woolen stockings, his dark velvet breeches with buckles at the knees, the long coat that people said made him look like a miniature version of his father. He dressed in careful silence so as not to wake anyone else in the house. He had no idea what they would do if they found him up so early. They were kind folk, good people who were friends of his mother. There was a chance they would have no issue with a six-year-old boy going out onto the streets of London on his own like this but it was better not to find out. The adventure was worth the risk. After all, they said the dead body swinging from the gallows was one of the most notorious pirates of his day. By the time he felt his way downstairs and stepped out into the street, the sky was just beginning to shift from inky black to bruised grey. John knew the streets of Wapping far better than the house that had been his home ever since his mother's health deteriorated and he moved swiftly along the narrow lanes and alleyways. He passed silent, lifeless houses that he knew were home to joiners and shipwrights, to coopers and caulkers and boatmakers, men with whom his father had business whenever he was home. John was careful to keep away from the sewage that flowed in streets toward the Thames and knew well enough how foul the stench would become as the summer's day progressed. People called it the evil odour, and it was one of the reasons he had chosen to make his trip at first light, when the air was still cool. There were other reasons too, like the fact that at such an early hour the crowds would have not formed. He could get close to the body, close enough to see it in all its tortured glory, and if he needed to, he could run away without any trouble. Within minutes, he rounded a corner and came face to face with the Thames. He stopped. The river was full, just like it always was. But no matter how many times he had seen the same view, it was impossible not to pause and stare at the floating empire laid out before him. There were hundreds of ships of all sizes and styles on the river. Brigs and snows, one-mast sloops and two-masted schooners, 
all designed and modified for their particular purpose. For every one of these merchant vessels, there were four or five barges nearby. Some would be ferrying customs officials on board to ensure the correct taxes were paid, some ferrying supplies to those waiting to leave. There was no limit to the power of British maritime trade. John ran his eyes over the scene, taking in every change since the day before. He knew some of the ships by name, and those he did not, he could read like words in a hymn book. Having grown up with a captain for a father, it was easy to tell apart the ones trading around the North Sea or the Mediterranean from those that went as far as the East Indies, bringing back silk and spices. The simplest to spot were the ships that headed south to the Guinea coast of Africa before taking their human cargo across the Atlantic and following the trade winds home, loaded with sugar, rum and tobacco. With their fenced-in quarters on deck and nets to prevent people jumping overboard, the slave ships were the only ones that looked like floating prisons. John stood and stared long enough for the sun to rise clear in the sky. When he felt light on his face, he turned away. Upstream was the rest of London, but he had no interest in Parliament or palaces. Downstream was where he wanted to go. Eventually, he'd join his father and make it out to the ocean and then on to the rest of the world. But first, it would take him to the place he had spent the last day thinking about. Execution Dock. John walked as far as he could along the Thames before the road led him away, passing shops and yards that were as familiar to him as the warmth of his mother's embrace. The moment the air turned stale with the smell of sweat and tobacco, rum and sugar, John's pace quickened. Even though his father was far away on a run to the Mediterranean and wouldn't return for months, John had no desire to linger near Captain Newton's favourite coffee shop. Instinct had taught him that the loud-mouthed, fierce-eyed men who frequented it were best avoided whenever possible. The sea trade was full of big men with loud voices and foul tongues who ruled by fear. John had been surrounded by them from the day he was born. He had learned how a man who had power out there on the sea, who commanded crews of mutinous sailors and navigated the dangers of pirates and privateers, demanded to be treated with deference and respect, even in his own home, especially by his only son. So John had grown up, knowing only ever to call his father Sir, to always walk ten paces behind him when in public, and to quickly drop his eyes to the ground the moment his anger flared. Fear was the one gift his father had given John. That, and the stiff cotton blanket, that was about as comfortable as sleeping beneath a canvas sail. John approached execution dock for the second time in as many days, yet now, early on Sunday morning, the place could not have looked more different from the way it had the previous afternoon. On Saturday, there had been thousands of people gathered, a giant press of cheering, happy onlookers. The crowd surged the length of the dock, overflowing onto the stairs that led to it, and onto the nearby riverbanks for a better view. John had tried to cleave his way through them, but it was no use. He had soon found himself crushed on all sides like a ship trapped in the ice in the frozen north. He had been forced to retreat farther down river and follow events as best he could from a distance. The procession had sounded more like a carnival than a death march, with people cheering and laughing all around as it made its way from the Tower of London down past London Bridge. John had only caught a glimpse of the High Court Marshal walking at the front, carrying a silver oar as a sign of his authority. Behind him, John guessed, was the cart with the doomed man and the chaplain should the condemned wish to confess his sins. He hadn't been able to see the man approach the gallows hadn't been able to hear whether he addressed the crowd or not, but he had heard the shouts and cries of delight throughout the crowd as soon as the rope snapped tight and the noose did its work. Now, with the entertainment of the previous day over, John was almost alone as he approached the dock. The tide was out, revealing a wide track of dark mud 
rock and human waste that led down to the water's edge. Up by the shore, yet close enough to be almost completely covered by the river at high tide, were the gallows. John had passed them almost daily when there was no body and had often stared at the greasy algae that clung to the timbers, making them look like they belonged to a long-abandoned shipwreck. He'd asked his mother plenty of questions, like why the gallows were built down so close to the water, or what kind of crimes the men committed who were punished there. Her answers were always brief as she hurried him along. There was no mother to stop him now. There were no crowds for him to fight through either, no press of bodies that threatened to throw him from the stairs that led from the street down to the waterside. There were only the gallows, a handful of people milling around on the steps nearby, and a body turning slowly at the end of the rope, where it would remain until three tides had washed over it. John inched closer. Only one tide would have risen and fallen since the man was hanged the previous afternoon, but the body already was marked by the hours it had spent underwater. His hair spread in worm-like tendrils over his pale, bloated face. His eyes were locked open, staring out at the sky. There was a growing stench of seawater, sewage and decay around him, and the man's filthy, wet clothes were steaming in the morning sun. For a moment, it looked as if he was being slowly burned to death. Lord have mercy on the poor sinner, said a soft voice at John's side. He turned to see a man staring up at the rope, his head slowly shaking from side to side. Beyond him was a woman, her eyes narrowed and sour. There'll be no mercy for the likes of him, she spat. Nor should there be. Sinners get what they deserve. The man opened his mouth as if to speak, but the sound of nearby church bells left him silent. It was John's cue to leave, but he took one last look up at the body before turning to the man beside him, and he asked the question that had been with him all morning. Was he really a pirate? No, the man frowned. He was no pirate. He was a captain. A captain what became a thief, added the woman. Don't matter who you are, your sins will find you out. Them's that deserve it always end up swinging from the rope. John took the back route over the road, passing by the timber yard and out onto Gravel Lane. The streets were no longer empty, especially outside the churches, where knots of well-dressed people gathered and greeted one another politely. He sped up and danced around those waiting outside the parish church that his father attended whenever he was home. John never much liked it there. It was almost impossible for him to sit still for so long while the congregation chanted one long, slow psalm after another. When his attention wandered, which it always did, his eyes would wander. He'd take in the statues carved from marble and paintings in their gilded frames. They made him want to get out of the heavy pew and run, even more than the singing. His mother's church was a different story altogether. The building itself looked different, with no paintings and no statues, just plain walls and a simple pulpit at the front. His mother had tried to explain why there was such a contrast between his father's church and hers, something about Jesus forgiving people who truly repented of their sins. But to John, it only ever came down to the songs. Instead of droning through metrical psalms that left him trying to suppress his desire to yawn, in his mother's church, the dissenting chapel, as she called it, the songs made him feel alive. People sang with real feeling, like the words meant something, and the music. He heard one of the old men in the congregation say that when these tunes were first introduced, Queen Elizabeth herself had called them Genevan jigs. These were the sort of tunes that made him want to stand up and smile to throw his head back and bellow the words as loudly as if he was standing on deck calling to shore. The chapel service was just about to start as John nodded good morning to the old couple in whose house he had been staying for the past weeks. He slipped into the pew that he usually shared with his mother. Five Sundays had passed since she last sat next to him, 
five weeks in which he spent Monday to Saturday trying not to think about the way she looked before she left the city to stay with friends in the country, where the air would be better for her. But here, on Sunday, in the chapel, with nothing but empty space beside him, he was powerless to hold the thoughts back. It was bittersweet. As the room stood to sing the first hymn, he smiled. It was one of his mother's favourites, and his too. He sang, O God, our help in ages past. The words rose strong and warm within him. It wasn't hard to imagine his mother standing right beside him, her thick skirts that swayed as she sang, her eyes smiling as her high, clear voice guided him along the melody. Our hope for years to come. The way she would place her hand on his shoulder and draw him closer to her. The way she would squeeze tighter whenever they reached the words she liked best of all. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. The song over, the congregation returned to their pews, ready for the sermon. The minister's opening words were not what John expected. There is a body swinging down by the river today, he said, his slow Scottish baritone rolling through the chapel. Many saw him die. Many even cheered when he did. But I tell you this, we are none of us so very different from that sinner hanging at the dock. We are all fallen from God. We have all broken his covenant and transgressed his laws. None of us have a rag to cover our nakedness, so wretched are we. The minister paused, and the room froze in the silence. Head bowed, John felt as if the dead man's eyes were staring right at him. And yet, all of us have the hope of the gospel. All of us can be redeemed. The meanest and vilest of sinners may fly to Christ for mercy. The minister carried on for some time, talking about how the law was a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. John understood little, but he felt much. A twist in his stomach, a catch of breath in his throat, as if the air was suddenly weaker. Or maybe it was stronger. He couldn't tell. But he knew without a doubt that he was relieved when the sermon was finally over and the singing resumed and when he stood again to open his mouth and let his voice flow out, it was as if his mother was right there beside him. A week later, John woke up later than usual. It was already light outside, and there were voices downstairs. He recognised the old couple, but there was another voice speaking that was unfamiliar to him. He tried to make out what they were saying, but the voices were quiet and muffled. With the parlour occupied, he would struggle to slip out of the house unnoticed. Not that it mattered. He was feeling excited. His seventh birthday was fourteen days away, and he had it on good assurance that his mother would be well enough to receive him. He lay in bed, imagining what it would be like to board the coach and ride east to the fields of Kent. How he would polish the buckles on his breeches and shoes beforehand and be sure to shake every last moat of dust from his coat. He would tell her all the news from London, recount what he could of the sermons that she had missed on Sundays. He might even tell her about the great crowds that had gathered for the man who had been hanged, though he would report it all as rumour instead of first-hand experience. As soon as he was dressed, John skipped downstairs and into the parlour, still a little lost in his thoughts. The old couple were sitting down, but it was the presence of a stranger standing by the fireplace that brought him back to himself. He was younger than John's father, but looked just as sombre. Master John, said the old lady, not looking at anyone in particular. This is Mr. Catlett. It is with his family in Kent that your mother has been staying these past few weeks. Her voice trailed off. Nobody spoke. John decided to hide his confusion and offer a small bow, the kind he had seen his father give whenever he saw a wealthy merchant down by the docks. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Catlett. Am I to travel with you to see my mother today? Is she recovered early? 
There was no reply. He searched for an answer in the faces of the only people he knew, but they offered none. All eyes were on the man by the fireplace. His were fixed on the floor. Your mother, said Mr. Catlett, his voice barely making it out from his throat. She passed. Faith Gateway is an online community for readers to discover top Christian books and engage with their favorite Christian authors. They bring together content in many different forms, from daily blog posts to book excerpts, daily devotionals, free downloads, videos, giveaways, contests, free online Bible studies, and more. Faith Gateway is brought to you by HarperCollins Christian Publishing, which publishes works from some of the most beloved and most popular Christian authors in the world today. Faith Gateway provides unique opportunities to connect with those authors and their books as you seek answers to your biggest spiritual questions. Whether you are exploring Christianity or involved in full-time Christian ministry, Faith Gateway has the best resources to meet you where you are today and help you get to the next level in your spiritual journey. Faith Gateway is giving Listen Here listeners 15% off their first order with promo code LISTEN. Visit faithgateway.com to shop the store, sign up for daily devotionals, or join the latest free online Bible study. That's faithgateway.com and promo code LISTEN to receive 15% off your first order. Thank you for spending time with us, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen Here. Check back next week for more audiobook samples and maybe a special guest or two. Follow us wherever you listen to podcasts or find us on Instagram and TikTok at Listen Here Podcast. Visit our website, listenherepodcast.com, for more information or to find the books we've talked about. See you next week.